Um, the way I want to do this is one of my favorite bits of the Bible, particularly when you talk about mission, is the second bit of Isaiah. So from 40 all the way through to 66. And that whole chunk of Isaiah um, really talks a lot about how God is working in the world and what he wants to do. And when we talk about mission, one of the terms that uh, missiologist people use is the missio dei in Latin. In other words, the mission of God. And what they're trying to say with that is God is on a mission. God is doing something. And our job is just to figure out what God is doing and line up with him. Uh, I'll always remember one of our conferences, there was a Ukrainian preacher. And he said, sometimes we're like this. We're like, God, I want to come over here. Come on, God, keep up with me. Come on, God, I'm going over here. Come on. And he said, actually, it's supposed to be the other way around, where God is supposed to be going to us. I'm going over here. You, you come with me. And so thinking about the Missio Dei is thinking about the fact that it's, it's God's plan. He's got an idea. He knows what he wants you to do and where he wants you to go. He's got it all. And what we need to do is get in line with him. And one of the lovely things about this chunk of Isaiah is that it shows lots of different pictures, lots of different kind of names of God about what he's doing and how he's working. And so what we're going to do in these sessions is we're just going to take different kind of names that God calls himself and just think about each one for a while. So I'm going to talk for a bit, then we're going to get into groups and discuss that one, then we'll do another one, and we're just going to do that. And the first one is Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1. And we have this, Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit on him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. And um, so th this first kind of word is the servant. And actually, you get, you get four of these passages in Isaiah about the servant. Uh, chapter 42, 46, 49, and 52. And 52 is the most famous one where it talks about the suffering servant who's going to atone for sin. And the New Testament picks up a lot of these and, and refers them to Jesus as the servant of God who came to serve God. But, but this word is actually... Um, the, the word in Hebrew for servant is Obed. So when Jesse had his son Obed, who had a son David, that, that name, Obed. And in Arabic, the cognate of that is Abd, which is servant or slave. And so if you've got a friend called Abdullah, which you may well have, he's the, the slave of God uh, or the servant of God. And so... The thing with this word is, it can mean servant and it can mean slave. And in your Bible, it gets translated as both. Um, which, you know, in English, there's a bit of a nuance there, isn't there? A servant is very different to a slave. But here, actually, if you think we're talking about um, God talking about mission as being like being a servant to people, we think, we think of that, you know, how can I serve you? We talk about ministries, that means serving but if you think of mission as being a slave to people, that feels a little more extreme, doesn't it? Uh, and so that's the, the picture here. And in the Old Testament, you get a lot of uh, pictures of mission to the nations as being through someone who's sent somewhere as a servant or a slave. So you think of Joseph. He's sold as a slave to Egypt. He's a slave in Potiphar's house. He's a slave of Pharaoh. But actually, in that position of being a slave and being far away from home and in exile and no rights and no recourse to anything, God uses him as a witness to Pharaoh. And you have the same idea with Daniel, don't you? He, he's dragged away as a young boy. His city sacked, his parents are killed. He's dragged away into exile. So he's a refugee, he's an exile, he's a slave. Uh, in Babylon, and yet while he's there, God uses him to witness to 
kings. And so you've got this picture of someone who's lost everything, who's got no rights or no claim on anything, and yet they're there able to be a witness to what God is doing. And I really like the picture of Naaman's servant girl in Two Kings, where he's, he's got leprosy, but he's got this servant girl in his house who says, oh, actually, there's a prophet in my country called Elisha, and he can heal you. And so Naaman listens to her and comes all the way. So she's just, she's a, you know, she's been dragged away from home, sold as a slave to a foreign country, but she's able to say to the guy, oh, this, I know a God that can heal you. You know, welcome, guys. And so this, this picture, you have it quite often in the Bible. And there was lots of places in the kind of Christian mission story where people did this. So the Moravian missionary movement, a lot of those guys were like, how are we going to get all over the world? We've got no money. We've got no way of getting to the nations. So some of them sold themselves into slavery so that they could get put on ships and taken off to other countries so that they could spread the gospel. And you're like, wow, that is commitment. Um, Today, if you go to some places like Saudi, some other Middle Eastern places, you'll find a lot of kind of Filipino workers in homes or Ethiopian workers in homes, a lot of whom have Christian faith and are actually, they're in a place where you couldn't possibly go as like a missionary, but they're there in people's households, with their kids, interacting, having influence in people's lives as servants or slaves, but able to bring gospel witness. And so it's an incredibly powerful picture, and God has used it actually all the way through the story of mission. And, and it's, it's also true with diaspora Christianity, isn't it? People that are taken out of their country, spread somewhere else, and yet God uses dispersion as deployment and uses it as an opportunity to bring Christian witness. And so, and then we see this, this picture of the servant fulfilled in Jesus in the New Testament in so many ways. Um, Jesus, he said, I haven't come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. So Jesus said, I've come so that I can serve people. You know, how can I serve you? And um, there's a proverb from the DRC, a Yombe language proverb says this, no serious person makes himself the leader of others. And I love it. So in their culture, they're seeing something about actually, if you're going to make big claims for yourself, you know, but here we've got this picture of the servant who doesn't cry aloud or lift his voice, but he will faithfully bring forth justice in the earth. And it's a wonderful picture of kind of faithfulness and perseverance, not making big claims, but I'm here to serve people with justice. And so it's a beautiful little picture. And with with Jesus, in so many ways, we read that he had everything, you know, he's like a prince in heaven, but he leaves that all behind, all his resource, all his luxury, all his comfort, and he takes the place of a servant. You know, so you read in Philippians 2, he emptied himself, um, which is, one commentator calls it a divine self-limiting. He like, he, he, he's unlimited, he's God, but he chose to limit himself to a particular place. Uh, you know, Jesus wasn't a Middle Eastern man, but he chose to limit himself to being a Middle Eastern man at a certain time, at a certain place, so he could serve those people with the gospel. And so incarnation is a form of being a servant, enslaving yourself to a certain people at a certain time in order to serve them with the gospel. And when Jesus washes the feet of his disciples in John 13, you know, they're all in shock. And Peter's like, how dare you? You can't, no, no, you can't wash my feet. I should wash your feet. Washing the feet was the job that the lowest, lowest, lowest slave did. In fact, in a Hebrew household, you wouldn't let a Jewish slave wash feet. It had to be like a non-Jewish slave. It's that dirty. It's that low status. And yet Jesus chooses to do that, saying, I'm going to take the lowest place. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to do the thing that no one else wants to do. And so, you know, we just have this question, don't we? What does it look like for us to wash the feet of our cities? You know, the dirty places, the places where no one else wants to go, the people that no one else wants to serve. How do we serve those people? And when Jesus is sold for 30 pieces of silver, that's, that's the price of a slave. It's not the price of a, a free man. And so even in his crucifixion, he dies the death of a slave on a cross. It's, uh, it's, it's him embodying this picture in Isaiah of, I'm sending a servant to serve people with the gospel. 
And Paul uses this picture. So in 1 Corinthians 9, the kind of famous passage, you know, for though I'm free from all, I've made myself a servant or slave to all that I might win more of them. I've become all things to all men, you know, to the Jew, I became a Jew to the Gentile. And so again, he's saying, I've chosen to make myself a slave to different communities in order to serve them. So, uh, Wiedemann, he says this about the 1 Corinthians 9 verse, a slave was an outsider who brought no rights with him from the society he came from and had no claims on the society which maintained him. So it's kind of this loose person, you know, you've got no legal rights. I, I've, in northern Cyprus, um, there's a little fellowship of um, Filipino Christians kind of connected to our family. Some of you have met Wig and Jean before who lead that. And um, one of the things that they do is they help Filipino house workers in northern Cyprus because often they turn up the person who they're working for takes their passport away so they can't leave and then they just work long, long hours for very little play. So it's a form of modern slavery. And so one of the things that Wig and Jean do is kind of encourage people and help them get their sort of legal recourse and help them fight for, for justice in their space. But it's, it's this thing of you've got no rights, no way out, no recourse. And... I think, what does that look like for us in terms of mission? It's the opposite of the kind of classic missionary picture, isn't it? Of We live in our nice compound on the hill with our air-conditioned house and our gated compound. And then in the morning, we drive down into the village and we serve the natives. And then in the evening, we drive back to our nice compound again and you know, watch our Netflix and live in our little foreign bubble. And you think, this is the opposite of that. This is saying, how am I going to live among people and serve them and not have any rights or any way of escape, any recourse. It's a very different picture. And so, just how does this verse help us if we think of ourselves in this picture of, behold my servant, you know, it's like God is lifting you up and going, hey, everybody, look at this. It's a lovely verse, actually. Behold my servant, whom I uphold. You know, God's saying, I'm... I'm giving you the strength, I'm keeping you safe, I'm protecting you. My chosen, you know, you're not here by chance. I think for someone like Daniel, that would be hugely encouraging, wouldn't it? You haven't just been dragged off into Babylon, but I chose you, I put you there. I've got a plan for you. In whom my soul delights. That's a lovely verse. Yeah. I've put my spirit on him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And I think it's, it's so easy sometimes if you're, you know, for us, we're in, when we're in Istanbul, a city of 15, 20 million people, and you think, yeah, I can share the gospel with a few people, but am I, you know, this is huge. I'm tiny. I'm making a little scratch. You know, did the devil even notice that I came and left, you know? And I think it, it's so easy to feel that sort of smallness. And then this verse says, yeah, but behold, my chosen and in whom my soul delights. Um, and I've put my spirit upon him. And you think that's, that's true of Jesus, but then it's true for all of us because we're in Christ. And so it's true for us as well. And so that's the first kind of picture or big word that we wanted to talk about was servant. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take 10 minutes, get into a group, make your group five or six people if you can. And then just discuss for 10 minutes. What, what do you think about this word? What do you think about that in terms of your context and what God's called you to do? How can you, you know, how can you express this mode of the mission of God, being a servant, being a slave? What does that look like in your world? Does that make sense? So a group of five or six people, and you've got 10 minutes just to kind of bash this out, okay?